journey away from the sun, past Earth and the inner planets, millions upon millions of miles. It's here that giants lurk. Jupiter and Saturn, spheres so cold and distant that the sun is no more than a tiny beacon in a vast twilight. are the frigid outer reaches of the solar system, the edge of darkness. It's a new uncharted territory out there. It's a new frontier at the edge of the solar system. And the next few years are going to probably bring many surprises. Already, we've found gossamer rings around gargantuan planets. We've detected atmospheres on worlds that barely catch the light of day. We've spied a moon with a king-size crater, and other moons pocked with celestial buckshot. We've seen a planet-sized moon with an icy crust cracked like an eggshell. And beneath it, possibly an ocean warmed by volcanoes and supporting life. The outer reaches are weird and wonderful. Lakes of liquid methane on a moon that resembles early Earth in deep freeze. A moon that spews brimstone. Another that vents nitrogen. Exotic and eccentric moons. Moons, however rugged, that are mere slaves to their gigantic masters. Masters like Jupiter, a gas bag so big it could swallow every planet and moon of the solar system and still have room to spare. Farther out, Saturn and its spectacular rings, the show-off of the planets. Even farther, Uranus, with its tilted axis, the result of some ancient collision. And more distant still, Neptune, last of the four gas giants, ringed with rocky particles. But there's yet another planet that may not be a planet at all, Pluto, whose crazy elliptical path occasionally takes it inside Neptune's orbit, a planetary joker. Close in toward the sun are the terrestrial planets, the planets that are made of rocks and silicates, like the Earth. Further away are the gas giants, mostly made of hydrogen, a lot of water. And furthest away are the really weird things, the icy dwarfs, things like Pluto. Pluto has a moon, Charon, half the size of the planet. They circle each other face to face, as though joined by an invisible bar, a diminutive couple waltzing in a candlelit ballroom. Physically being on Pluto would be rather interesting. For one thing, the lighting levels are about one thousandth what they are on Earth. Uh, that means uh, its noonday sun would look like uh, what the sun looks like now about 35 minutes after sunset. It'd be this kind of glow in the sky, and you could see stars in the daytime sky. There has been some controversy whether Pluto is a planet or some other object like a large comet or an asteroid. Well, certainly Pluto does meet all the criteria for being a planet. But the other interesting thing is that uh, Pluto, in fact, may be the largest body of a collection of material, so-called the ice dwarfs, which in turn may be the parent material for comets themselves. This is the kind of material we've never seen before and very, very intriguing because it may be some of the most primitive material in the solar system. That's why NASA is planning a mission to Pluto. But timing is of the essence. As Pluto flies through space, its distance from the sun changes. At its farthest and coldest, the atmosphere freezes from gas to solid. The Pluto Express wants to get there while Pluto still has a gassy atmosphere. It's a four billion mile trip, 
and NASA plans to use another planet as a kind of celestial slingshot. We can do a gravity assist on Jupiter, basically flying past Jupiter in order to push our trajectory toward Pluto. And this saves us flight time, and it also allows us to fly in a cheaper launch vehicle. Pluto Express is a much, much smaller spacecraft. It's about one-tenth the weight, smaller instruments, smaller radios, less power consumption. Everything is utilizing that technology. This desire to explore the outer worlds goes back decades. One of our most successful missions was Voyager, launched in 1977. Voyagers 1 and 2 have traveled billions of miles into space, and Voyager 2 is still sending back data. It was a long journey to the outer planets, the Voyager twins used Jupiter's gravity to accelerate and redirect themselves. Saturn also was a stepping stone. But here, the two craft parted company. Voyager 1 moved away from the solar system, while Voyager 2 traveled on to the remote outer planets. The Voyager twins carried many sensors. The most valuable of these were the TV cameras that in 1979 recorded the king of planets, Jupiter. Jupiter is surrounded by courtiers. 16 moons spin around in the Jovian kingdom. The Voyagers sent back images of moon shadows playing across the great planet's face. Voyager also witnessed firsthand the storms that raged in Jupiter's atmosphere. Angry clouds of gas and perpetual turmoil race around the equator. One storm, the Great Red Spot, is thousands of miles across, a huge swirling vortex of gas. The Great Red Spot is the largest weather system in our solar system. Two years later, the Voyagers presented us with our first good look at Saturn. It's been observed ever since we've looked into the skies. Its hallmark is its rings. The broad rings are actually thousands of individual ringlets, like grooves on a phonograph record. Trillions of icy moonlets that glide around the planet's girth. Staring into space toward these rings from Saturn's cloud tops, everything seems serene. Nothing could be further from the truth. Saturn's storms are of epic proportions. Just like our own planet Earth, uh, Saturn is tilted over on its axis about 23 odd degrees. This means that it has distinct seasons as it travels around the sun once every 30 years. And we have noticed that every Saturnian summer, a huge storm erupts from deep within Saturn, bursts onto the surface, and these storms probably would look like great blizzards of ammonia snow. Life would perish in seconds here. Saturn's a typical gas giant with chemistry unlike anything on Earth. Well beyond Saturn, the Voyagers are now approaching the edge of the solar system, the heliopause. 